But we're facing what is uh, really an, an affrontal assault against the family. It's having a detrimental effect, a toxic effect. When it comes to issues of, of family marriage, I do think that there is a grassroots change that is taking place that makes me hopeful. Welcome everyone to the Coalition for Marriage YouTube channel. Pleasure to have you joining us. If you're joining us for the first time, uh, we are the UK's uh, leading pro-marriage organization. Tens of thousands of individuals and groups who support this thing, one man, one woman marriage. And we come from all faiths and none as a background, all political spectrums. But we believe that man, woman marriage is something special and unique. That's not to say other things don't take place in society. Of course they do. And also sadly, sometimes of course, marriages break down and people do the best they can on their own if that's if that's the situation they're in. But marriage, all the research seems to indicate, brings about the the, the best version of the next generation for kids. It's the it's the predictor of, of happiness for adults. It really is something which we feel needs to be preserved, protected, promoted uh, in society. And that's why we speak to lots of people who agree with us on that, all different aspects of that, from all faiths and none. Today, we have a wonderful Christian author uh, with us, somebody who's a pastor, uh, somebody who's a commentator, a writer, speaker, uh, all over the continental US and further afield. Pleasure to be talking to the Reverend Paul Dirks. Paul, would you like to say hello to our listeners and our viewers? Yeah, we would love to. Yeah, what a, what a wonderful um, organization you have there, Tony. It's great to be with you. And uh, I'm, I'm so thankful that there are organizations like yours fighting to preserve what really uh, you know, needs to be at the root of, of our conservation efforts. You know, many things are being attacked, but uh, marriage and, and family begins everything. And so, uh, if you know, if, we, if we're going to save society, to, to put it in the starkest terms, we need to start with, uh, with marriage and family. Now, the reason I wanted to talk to you is because you've just released a book. Um, and tell us a little bit about the, uh, the, what, what drove you to, to write this book, um, Deep Discipleship for Dark Days, for, coming from Paul Dirks. We've got all the Ds in there. We love alliteration. So you're yeah. off to a great start. But tell us what's driven you to write this book before I go into some of the detail. And there's a, there's a chapter on marriage and family that I really want to get into. But the whole context of the book is, is really useful. What prompted you to write this book? Yeah, thanks, Tony. I was, you know, we were dealing with um, with with COVID and how that was affecting the church here in in Canada. And um, I'm not sure if you know the some of the situation around that, but there was some real yeah. disparities in yeah. how yeah. Uh, the the state, which has grown here in in, in Canada, to be um, you know, all pervasive. You know, maybe that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but but perhaps not by too much. And, uh, and we saw that there were these incredible disparities between what the state was permitting in regards to church gatherings and in regards to other sorts of, um, you know, whether it was support groups or, uh, or even, you know, at times bars were open, but the churches were not allowed to meet. And so, you know, this, this caused a lot of um, consternation in, in our church leadership, but, but we recognized because of some of my work in, in advocacy on um, you know, sex and gender issues, we recognized amongst our leadership, even if we had some different views on, you know, on COVID itself or, or, or vaccines, those kinds of things, we recognized that, that there was a link here between, um, you know, the pressures of the state and um, kind of the totalitarian, soft totalitarianism that's creeping in here in Canada and, and to some degree globally. And so, uh, you know, I thought, how do I, how do I ready my, my people for, what's coming and i touch on these things to some degree in 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 my sermons i believe that the, the christian message affects all of life and so that includes politics that includes what goes on globally but um at the same time i, I wanted to get into some specifics that i may not have an opportunity to, to teach on regularly how do i prepare my people um you know how do i alert others to what's going on and how to live faithfully and and you know optimistically even in this day and age and so that was really the impetus for writing the book my church actually gave me um a week off of preaching to to do this and a, I, a week did you say a week i no, sorry a month sorry i think i might have said <laughs> <laughs> you're a fast writer <laughs> uh gave me a month and actually god was really with me in that i i probably got two-thirds of the of the book done in that in that month uh and then you know as always takes you know, it takes time to finish and, and put the, 
you know, put the finishing touches on it. But yeah, that was the genesis for, for the book, um, helping mainly Christians, but not only Christians, be be understand what's going on and then how do we address it from the standpoint of our personal lives our families um and then out into society and churches it's a very well referenced book and very contemporary in its references too so that's quite good and one of the chapters in it um do your homework was of particular interest to me which is talking about the home now i've interviewed many authors and and specific authors who like you are trying to get uh, churches and Christians and pastors to recognize the need to understand what's going on around them culturally and to get involved in educating their people on how to think and how to be salt and light in that culture. Carl Truman, for example, uh, yeah. said M- marriage is at the heart of the cultural war that we're in, which is quite interesting. And you, as you say, in Canada, you've faced some pretty interesting times recently, but Maybe we'll get into some of that. I just want to focus on chapter five in your book, Dan, which which looks at this whole idea of um, what's happening to marriage and family and the idea that people need to wake up to it and what they need to do about it, too. So maybe we can explore that for a for a little while. So looking at the chapter, what what's going on then? What what's the what's the problem? Why do we have to worry about families? Who cares if things change, if cultures change? You know, who cares? What's the problem? The the problem is the incredible pressure. Some of them are um, that we're facing. I, I, I know some of these in the UK, some of them perhaps more in Canada, but we're facing what is really an, an, a frontal assault against the family uh, on several fronts. But in other ways, what we have is something a little bit more subtle. And um, you might describe it rather than the frontal assault as kind of the, the seeping chemical warfare that, you, you know, you may not smell, you might not realize it right away. And yet it's it's having a detrimental effect, a toxic effect on on our families and uh and and some people may not be aware of those they might see some of the frontal assault but they may not see some of this more subtle uh, attacks in the culture so you know here in here in canada um you know we're, we're having uh, a curriculum in our schools called soji 123 that is very upfront about not just normalizing um you know sexual orientation and gender identity issues and um and a homosexual lifestyle but but they're very explicit about it we've got books within our system and we're not talking about just one or two schools we're talking about many schools taking these books wanting to educate children and in many cases they have very explicit not just words but graphics in them um in some cases literal child child pornography um actual graphic depictions of adult child sex in our schools and where this has been um, pointed out so far, our political leaders, by and large, have not been willing to address it. So you've got some of these frontal assault things which threaten uh, our children and grandchildren uh, who may be exposed to this. And of course, we could talk more about even you know the pervasiveness of pornography, you know, online and through technology. But it's also it's also subtle pressures, and even when it comes to things like. Um, gay marriage being you know that that legislation and how that undermines the definition of marriage and actually gives to the state uh power that they they have no right to have and that now they're wielding and are able to wield against family traditional family cultures and structures so um you know this is what our, our families are facing uh, and this creates all sorts of new problems and pressures. You know, how do we navigate that? So that this is this is part of what the, the chapter is about. Mm. And and we, I mean, we have, I suppose, over here, very similar to you guys. Um, in fact, somebody sent me some educational materials just recently, uh, which which advise the teachers wherever possible try and steer away from talking about marriage and permanent relationships. So mm. it's, it's not. We have our education act stumbles to recommend balance but largely it's ignored in schools it seems these days nobody wants to talk about marriage and family and it's coming through uh in terms of what's happening in the culture so that's that's one thing you mentioned which is very similar to what we've got over here you also talk about um uh fatherhood uh attitudes towards men this this concept of toxic masculinity tell us a little bit about that 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 aspect of the chapter what's going on there 
Yeah, I think one of the one of the things that we've seen, and I and I think it's in many cases it is pretty subtle, but what we've seen through entertainment and the messaging of our you know of our world in other ways as well, as certainly the university, certainly the education system, is this idea that men having uh, had power in society now you know need to be taken down a notch, and and this exaltation of non masculine uh, attributes, characteristics, and, um, and, you know, the design that we have, I believe it's God's design, is that men and women are different, and that there's this beautiful balance that occurs within marriage, you know, good things about women are brought together with good things about men, and, and even weaknesses inherent in both are, um, you know, played off against one another and, and, and shorted up by the other. And, but we, we're living in a, in a time of incredible imbalance right now. Uh, you know, in, in the entertainment industry, it's, it's very rare to find wholesome male, um, role models. You, you do find some real male role models, but rarely it seems in connection with families, intact families, these sorts of things. Uh, you know, you could, you could illustrate this no doubt through watching the, you know, how, how Walt Disney has progressed over the last, even just the last 20 years in some of their movies and what's being portrayed. But what's happening now then is that, is that males are feeling like they're, you know, what makes them unique, whether it's the strength, the courage, the black and white thinking, the willing to engage in polemics, risk, risk behavior that um, of course sometimes have negative side effects, but, but is, is inherently good. Uh, this protective, you know, strength based protective aspect. Uh, these things are, uh, are seen in culture to, to not be a positive. And, and so men are not using what they have been given to, you know, in many cases, protect their families. We're, we're raised up to be the protectors of our families and, and by and large, we're not doing it. And it's, uh, and it's really the women and the children that suffer for it. One of the things that I think is inherent in our design is that, is that men, by and large, we can kind of, if things are not right in our, in our world, we can still sort of take care of ourselves. Um, but the, the ones who end up really suffering are, are the ones around us, uh, our, our women, our children, our families. And so, you know, one just one example of this i'm not sure if this is in the book or not but you know women are more open the personality studies say that they're more open to emotion and that we see this that's a good thing uh and yet uh this does create not only some positive aspects of of you know their relationships but also can create some negative ones as well and and they tend not to draw really hard lines when it comes to polemics in in culture so one example of that is that a lot, a lot of the work that I've done on sex and gender issues and protecting women's privacy rights, a lot of the polls that are done and the, uh, the studies show that women are actually more open to males who identify as women being in their washrooms, change rooms, showers than men are. So, which is, which is interesting because of course these are their spaces. But what's going on so often is that men well, first of all, they realize the the risk behavior that men themselves can, are willing to sometimes undertake to whatever, be voyeurs, etc. But also, men are willing to be black and white about things. Who cares if people don't like me about it, right? I'm, I'm going to, and whereas for women, the relational aspect tends to be stronger. And this is one example of that. So, I think a lot of the the slide in culture, whether it's around issues of marriage or other issues too, is in some part due to the fact that the the male kind of black and white polemical approach, willingness to stand up and say something, who cares what the result is, that kind of aspect is downplayed and families suffer, marriages suffer, children suffer, society suffers. What role do you think the the church has got to play in this. I mean, I, I happen to be a Christian. We, we, as I said at the beginning, we have supporters from all faiths and none. I would think it's fair to say that the majority of our supporters do come from uh, some Christian tradition or other. Um, I'm an evangelical Christian myself. 
what would you say the church's role in all this is? I mean, what, why, why bother pastors with this stuff? Isn't it just to do with the government and society and other and people's personal choice? From a larger perspective, um, the, the church needs to realize that they have a prophetic role in the world. And I take that from a pretty conservative theological standpoint. So, uh, but, but still, we, we have this role where we are to speak out uh, with God's truth on whatever's going on in society. Um, and, and this is something that we take part in every year together with a group of um, churches in Canada and in the United States. Uh, on the, uh, the, the anniversary of legislation, of the anti-conversion therapy legislation that came through. Oh, that yeah. again. Yeah, yeah. On the anniversary, these, all these churches get together and we actually preach on biblical sexuality. Um, and, and, and we just kind of think, well, at some point, some of us could get arrested for this because that's, that's possible in regards to the legislation. But we're going to keep speaking out because um, the truth protects people. The truth brings justice. The truth brings blessing. So my first chapter in the book is actually called "By a Sword," and that, that's meant metaphorically. The word is your, most of your listeners will probably know that the metaphor of the sword in uh, in the Bible talks about your willingness to speak speak truth. Yep. And so the church really has that role, and, um, and they need to be faithful in that role. The last chapter, ac actually, in the book is called Find the Faithful, because uh, my recommendation to Christians in this day and age is that you need to be surrounded by enough people that are willing to be courageous and to understand what's going on, so that if things progress further in the kind of the darkness or the, the pressures of this world, that you've got some people that are going to stand side by side with you, and you can, you can do this together. So that's kind of a large perspective, more specifically on family and, and sexuality and, and, and marriage. You know, our, our churches really need to understand that this is an issue that, first of all, protects, um, the truth protects, and it protects those within our congregation. It actually protects those outside the congregation, whether or not they, they feel that, um, but it does. It's a justice issue. And it's funny because in our, I don't know about, you know, your, your church network, Tony, but in my church network, there's a lot of people that, that talk about justice and say, you know, the church, we need to be doing a lot of justice things, but invariably what it ends up looking like is that they end up engaging in the kinds of justice matters that the world will pat them on the back for rather than the kinds of justice issues that are going to, in fact, earn the hostility of the world. And so we need to understand that justice comprehensively, both for those outside the church and for those inside the church. And we need to speak regularly about, you know, marriage issues, family issues, because of the incredible assault that's going on right now. And I think that's the point, isn't it? Every, every age has its blind spots. And, and our age seems to be this this sex and marriage kind of blind spot. It seems to be the thing which is troubling us as a, as a Western culture um, today. And, and that seems, to, and it, it's affecting everything, demography, all sorts of things in society, even to to medication and hospitals and, and you know, birthing people and people with, with body parts instead of man, woman, that sort of stuff, yeah. breast feeders, chest feeders, whatever it's called. You know, everything is being, turn topsy-turvy because of this little blind spot and and once you abandon um objective truth you get subjective madness and th yeah. that seems to be what we're getting all over the place and and the churches are uniquely placed to be able to talk about objective truth and maybe that's in this current day and age what they need to be doing so uh, in terms of uh, I suppose you also mentioned in, in the chapter that um, marriage is, is the, the unit of resistance. Um, what, what do you mean by that? What does that mean? Yeah, so that, that language, the, 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 mar the marriage or, or the family unit as a resistance cell is, is taken, that, that phrase is taken from Rod Dreher's book, Live Not By Lies. Uh, it's an excellent book um, that, that's somewhat in line with, with the book that I've written, but it's a little more... In some ways, a little more broad. In some ways, a little more narrow. I mean, I, I mean that sounds kind of backwards. But if you read the both books, you understand. 
Um, but he's got this he's got uh, this interview that he does with the Benda family, uh, which who lived under uh, communist Czechoslovakia, communists in, in Czechoslovakia, and and uh, they were able to um, really keep their family in the midst of that. And one of the things they did, uh, getting to sort of the the practical aspect of how to do this in, in a family, is that they inculcated in their children a healthy us versus them um, culture. They realized that what their children needed was to understand the, what, the wickedness that was going on outside, you know, the, the walls of their family, and that, you know, we, uh, there's this difference between us and them. And that once the children understood that and lived that, they had to live that out in their school regularly and felt that, that difference, that hostility, that that actually was a protective aspect that prevented their children from being, um, you know, brainwashed by the, you know, by the communist, um, you know, propaganda. But the other thing that they did is they used their family as a resistance cell, as, as a place in which others could seek refuge and could find counsel. In many cases, this uh, this family, I believe it was the same family, I'm pretty sure, that as they were coming out, that as um, others were coming out of jail in some cases or going in for, uh, you know, interviews with the police, that people would often stop at their house on the way yeah. and they would gain yeah. prayer and they would, right. you know, they would gain that support because they knew yeah. where this family yeah. stood. Yeah. And, and again, you know, do others know where your family stands on these issues? Yeah. Because yeah. it's then that you're able to be this resistant cell and ha kind of help others along as yeah. well. Yeah, it reminds me of, um, I, I spoke to a lady called Kimberly Ells, um, who, who wrote a book called The Invincible Family. And she spoke, she spoke, yeah, she spoke about the fall of communism in Hungary. And she, she cited exactly that, how actually it fell because, um, you know, parents, if they were found talking against the state to their children, they would be separated from their children and likely die. Um, but w when their children were old enough to, to be trustworthy, they would take them into the cellar in the evening after school, find out what they were taught and re-educate them. And, and this happened throughout society, uh, up, up to the extent where all of a sudden, once they grew up, there, there was nobody left to be a communist because every, all the kids had grown up realizing that's not what we want. And, and it's funny because uh, our youngest is old enough now to come home and say things like, I'm glad our family isn't like that or in that kind of desperate situation. Uh, and I think, again, it, it touches on some of the practical advice and let's move on to that, which you give in the chapter of providing that, that place of solace. Uh, and it's it's one reason why uh, all these different, um, you, you know, from the Gay Liberation Manifesto to loads of other manifestos have spoken about destruction of the family, because family is where you pass on uh, customs and habits and practice from one generation. It's where children learn what their values are. And if you want to disrupt that, you've got to disrupt, disrupt families. So the antidote to that is to fight especially to make sure you know, that you and your wife, husband and wife, really are the, the, the solid units that are there as a bedrock to providing that stable home, you know. And that's absolutely 100% vital. It's not about the two of you, it's about the home you're providing. And, and that, I think you make that point in the book, um, among lots of other points. So give us, give us some more great advice. How, what, what can we say to families? How can we protect against the storm which is here and is likely to get worse? Yeah, so a few things come to mind. One is one is the role of routine and ritual in the home. Yep. And the regular rhythms of our lives can be so powerful in communicating to children uh, things like identity, um, true religion, what that, you know, what that looks like. Um, you know, one of the things that we need to understand is that all of the movements in our society, all the ideologies, they're really identity conferring uh, ideologies. And, and this is something that in a world, if you don't have a strong family identity, a family culture, these, these isms and ideologies can be very attractive to young people. And of course, this is, this is, you know, whether it's the LGBT movement or some other movement, they're, they're, they're bringing in children, uh, in many cases, trying to in, indoctrinate them. It's certainly happening in our schools here in, in Canada. So, um, 
routine and ritual are a powerful way that just to build in identity conferring truths uh, uh, into the day to day life. And so, you know, one of the things that my family does is that we have breakfast and supper together almost every day, those two. Um, and but even, you know, I think studies show this, it's been a while since I've looked at them. But even if a family does one meal together a day, free of distraction, just us talking, us talking about our day around that meal, that is an immensely uh, protective uh, event. So, so routines are powerful, you know, doing something before bed uh, as a routine or uh, for myself as a Christian, we're going to read the Bible, we're going to sing a hymn together, um, uh, you know, or we're going to memorize scripture together. But those routines are powerful in, in bringing together a, an identity. Ritual is another really important one. Rituals tend to be more uh, religious in nature than, uh, than routines. And, and usually less frequent. But these things too are something that are very, very important. And our culture really has very few rituals in it anymore. And, uh, and this is something that it's, it's not surprising that we tend to, to lose children when they don't have strong identity conferring rituals. It, most cultures for most of time have had rituals that, uh, you know, will bring a, a young woman or a young man into, into manhood, into, uh, womanhood. And, you know, we don't really have any of those anymore either. One of the things that, uh, that I recommend in the book is to have a set of, um, of some sort of identity statement or even, or even visual. I'll, I'll give you an example in a second, but to even have things like a house, house rules or house, um, identity sta statement. Here's the question that I think people really need to think through. And, and it is however you answer it. It is this, what makes our family unique? Yeah. What makes our family um, good? Uh, what, are those, question. what are those things that bind us together so that we, so this person, this child knows who we are, knows who I am? Yeah. Um, and that's something that I think we've lost uh, to a great degree in our culture. Let me give you one example of this. My family has actually over the, over the last few years, it actually took a long time to, to get to the final step of this, but we've actually made a new family emblem and, and you know, uh, coat of coat of arms that we've taken several aspects of what we think define our family. We've put that into a shield. We actually spent some good money on getting it illustrated. So it looks really good. Um, we've got a motto on it, uh, virtue unto glory. That's our motto. It's in Latin, but uh, and, and so we, you know, we look at that, it, it has two, um, the, the standard bearers on either side, one of them is a beaver, the other one's a leopard. And so we'll walk, the beaver stands for we're hard workers, that's what we want to be. And then the leopard is that we're willing to take risks. And so, you know, as I'm reminding my 10 year old as he head, heads out the door, I can say, listen, be a beaver today. And he knows what that means. That defines who we are as a family. Or, you know, I remind one of my one of my girls that might be a little more risk averse than I am, like we're leopards. This is what we do. We, we're willing to take risks for, for, for what is good, what is true, what is of God. Very, that's very advanced, Paul. Having your own crest is quite, you know, we all have our little phrases like be a shepherd, not a sheep and stuff like that. Yeah. But having your own crest, man, that's impressive. <laughs> I can't, <laughs> I, I can just imagine the bun fights we would have around the table agreeing on that one. <laughs> well, well, well done to you. That, that's fantastic. Thank you. What, what about, I mean, how do we, how do we restore the, the, the idea of um, fatherliness and, 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 um, you know, masculinity is a good thing. I mean, how do we, how do we get those things? How do we, you know, let boys recognize that actually they've got a They've got a role in life and, and live up to it. I mean, I think, I think the, the, the Christian message, message particularly is an interesting one because I, I think it's more attractive than any Marvel plot that, that exists, you know, if it's, if it's preached and, and told properly. And that should attract manly men to come and be men, you know, a kind of um, an eternal f fight between good and evil, you know, all the sorts of things. It's just, it's incredible to be the best you can. You know, who's on the Lord's, it, it's just a wonderful kind of way of engaging what it means to be a man. How do we, how do we plug men back into society in a constructive, helpful way that, that enables them to feel and to be fulfilled, which actually is all women want in a man anyway? 
Yeah, so I mean, I think you've hit hit on it already, Tony, and that is that you need to sell the idea of the war, the the idea that you know men are. There's a reason that you know we're, um, you know, that we we love a, a good comic book. There's a reason why you know we'll love a good sports match. Um, you know why certain movies appeal to us. You know, a good war movie or or whatever. Uh, it, we're men are built for war, and and that means that you know that we we need to train our, our boys to be ready to recognize first of all recognize what the biggest fight is at, as you said good against evil um and that the christian message as you know i mean i'm just saying exactly what you just said but but it's it's really crucial that that churches recognize that that fathers recognize the appeal of this us versus the dragon kind of yeah. Yeah, um yeah. Yeah. you know this picture and to have to have books that enforce that, to have entertainment that enforces that, to have preaching that enforces that, um, and and you know one of the things that you know if you're a Christian, I know I to try to tell my my men, listen, bring your son along to prayer meeting, because that's where you know he's going to see that there's some spiritual warfare going on here and how dad engages in it. Take take your you know tell your tell your son your war stories. Oh, and hopefully as a father, you've got some of these, right? That, um, you know, you've engaged in this way and people didn't like you for it because of what you said. Tell that, let, let your boy be proud of you in that because that's what you're trying to train in him. Um, even from a, even from just kind of a mundane perspective, when the boys are wrestling on the floor, let them wrestle, right? Yeah, maybe they knock something over. Maybe they, you know, when, when the wife says, you know, stop wrestling. Then, then maybe the husband needs to say, "No, listen, we're we're raising, you know, we're raising boys here. We're raising men. We're not raising sheep. We're not raising um, women. Right? This is this is something they need to learn how to do. So, yeah, recognizing the big battle and being able to show our boys that the innate desire they have for even things like sports actually is a uh, a symbol uh, of of something greater that's been given to them. This this desire to fight against what is evil and to protect others and to inculcate that and um, and not to quash it. Yeah, and you've got that 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 protect others. You know, w- women again. It's it's a massive generalization, and I'll get shot down for this. But women want to be protected, and men want to be respected. You know, and and actually, one feeds the other. You know, if if a man. Uh, feels respected by his woman he will protect her and if she feels protected by him she will respect him and and it just feel feeds into a massive upward loop and so many couples get themselves into a downward spiral and they just need to switch it back the other way one needs to take the upper ground and switch it back the other way and start giving uh, respect or protection or love where it's where it doesn't feel like it's deserved and just feed that loop back up again because it's amazing when it gets going yeah, well said. Yeah, well, one of the things that I try to teach my men is that um, is that authority or strength, whatever word you like, authority. I know it's it's got this bad connotation, but whatever that is that that you know that men tend to have that authority, that strength, that is for a particular purpose. It's for promoting someone else, uh, and so and which is exactly what you're talking about that upward that upward spiral. Um, and so, yeah, you, you don't use any kind of strength or authority. You need to teach your boys that too. What do you use your strength for? You're stronger than the girls, right? In almost all cases. What do you use that for? Use it to serve them. Use it to lift them up. You use it for good. And, yeah. and, and for Christians, you know, you use it to, to, to love your wife like Christ loved the church and offered his life for it. Yeah, yep. precisely. Your, your job is to lay down your life for that person. Uh, yeah. every day and 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 really even every day to win them and say well, would she choose me today am i being the man that she would choose today you know, that's yeah. a challenge for all of us isn't it really? <laughs> yeah listen well you, you 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 end the chapter um uh and 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 then it's only chapter five and you've got the rest of the book in front of it but you also end the book as well saying look you know things are going to go one of two ways in society and we're not too sure you know it, it could get better because some of the laws you know, some of the governments around the place are saying, hold on a minute, but actually it could get an awful lot worse and, and who knows? And so you then say, well, we need to prepare for both, if you like. But I'm just wondering, what's your your sense? I mean, is there a sense of 
of a, a sound of a rushing in the mulberry bushes in Canada? Are things going to improve、um, or not? What do you think? When it comes to issues of, of family, marriage, gender, sexuality, I, I've been、um, engaged on this topic and、uh, for long enough that it's been it's been interesting and I think helpful to see some some changes, and、uh, and I do think that there is a grassroots change that is taking place that makes me hopeful,、um, and 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 so I'm I'm actually far more more hopeful.、Um, Not in the ultimate sense. I'm always I'm always optimistic in the in the largest sense、uh, of you know God's going to work out His purposes. At, you know, the, you know the family's not going to die off.、Um, but when it comes to sort of the the near term future, I'm far more hopeful than I was two years ago.、Uh, and and some of that is helped actually by our neighbors to the south who tend to be more courageous, although also sometimes a little more belligerent. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, I, I, in general, I'm okay with people that are belligerent if they're speaking the truth. I, I, I think that personally, I think our Canadian culture tends towards cowardice. So, if somebody's speaking truth, then then I'll, you know, even if they might not say it exactly the way I would,、uh, I'll I'll be thankful for that. But I am encouraged. So, a couple of things that are happening right now that encourage me. One is that, in some ways, not always, sadly, but but in some ways,、uh, the the major conservative party here. In Canada, has、um, has started to turn a corner in realizing that、uh, you know where they need to draw lines and where they need to fight back on some issues regarding the family.、Um, so that's good, and they are. Well, I, I noticed some.、Uh, is it Paul Polivier? He's getting a bit of yeah, profile yeah, yeah, internationally yeah. now. Quite interesting for being a bit of a wit, apart from anything else. <laughs> yeah, he really cut his teeth in Parliament,、um, and、uh, and so he's yeah he's he's actually. Cultivated、uh, quite a wit over over time and an ability to deal with、uh, with media, and which is a, a good thing in especially in a conservative politician.、Uh, the media are rarely on your side.、Um, yeah, so so there's some good changes there. You know, sadly, this is the same conservative party that voted、uh, without a single、um, defector, without a single person contradicting. They voted on mass in favor of this. Horrific anti-conversion therapy bill, which、um, which had all sorts of political shenanigans、uh, in the background around it. So so there's there's still some major issues, but but there's a turn that's occurring.、Uh, there are some good people in that party that are helping to turn that around.、Uh, and again, our our neighbors to the south have some of the states have made significant gains,、uh, and that. That that shifts the whole conversation. That Overton window. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Of sort of where public discourse is sort of allowed to happen.、Um, it, it shifted that, and、uh, and so I, I, I'm I'm more optimistic than I was a couple of years ago. Th- things can actually change quite quickly、yeah. when they start. Um, That's right. So it's looking for those green shoots and seeding those green shoots, and never giving up. Yes, you know, never giving up, and it's not about numbers. We, those who are, you know, of a, of a Christian persuasion, are Christians. They know biblically it's not about numbers, big numbers. Things、yeah. can change radically, very, very quickly, if、uh, if that's the way they're meant to go. You know. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And and so it's encouraging. I mean, right now, we have the Sikh community、uh, as well as many Muslims here in the Lower Mainland actually activated. In speaking out against what's going on in the schools, and that's new. I know that when I started working on these issues, I tried to reach out to Sikhs and Muslims, and none of them wanted to touch it.、Um, and and now they're leading the charge, and actually now they're looking around and going, "Hey, where are all the Christians?" <laughs>、uh, so that's how much things have turned.、Um, so that's encouraging. Well, listen, Paul. Deep discipleship for dark days. Great read.、Uh, really well researched. Really well written.、Um, I, I as I said to you, I think I'm. I um I picked it up to read the introduction and I read the whole thing because I couldn't put it down. It doesn't often happen. So thank you very much. Great book. Thank you so much for your time today. And、uh, let's get together and talk about it again soon. Paul Dirks,、Great. thank you. Thank you, Tony.